In this lesson, we're going to begin our assessments of the UN Security Council, looking at a critical perspective of its work and operations, specifically just asking the general question, the extent to which the UN Security Council is actually successful in the mandate that it is provided. And essentially, in examining this question, looking at the nature of the success of the UN Security Council and the extent to which the UN Security Council is successful, we have to look at what the mandate for the UN Security Council is. So we have to first identify what the UN Security Council actually is supposed to do and then highlight the success and failures of the UN Security Council in doing that particular thing. So according to the UN Charter, the UN Security Council is the main body of the United Nations that works to maintain peace and security around the world. Generally speaking, we can be a bit more specific if we wanted to be, but we can just take this broad uh, perspective, take this broad idea that the UN Security Council works to, quote, maintain peace and security around the world. And we can think, right, to what extent has it been successful in doing that? That is the question that we're going to ask. And if we want to know the success of the UN Security Council, we have to know how successful has it been in the maintenance of peace and security around the world? Well, there are a couple of arguments that we can have, and I'm going to just essentially present this into two dividing um, d debates, essentially. On the one hand, the UN Security Council is effective, and on the other hand, the UN Security Council is not effective. And on the first end of this, we can look at different various examples of how the UN Security Council has been effective, but also look at why it is effective and the instances in where it is effective specifically. What are the reasons why it has been effective in certain regards, but not in others? Well, Essentially, there are a number of key components of note when we look at the effectiveness of the UN Security Council. It seems that they are only really successful in circumstances where there is broad support for the implementation of intervention and or some kind of peacekeeping operation. Whatever the instrument of choice is for the UN Security Council, given a particular uh, situation, a particular troubled circumstance, the extent to which it is successful depends almost on the broad implementation of the uh, particular innovation that it is trying to achieve. And so the implementation of that and the support for the implementation of that is something that has to be reconciled. It usually requires, uh, as a result, clear objectives, realistic goals, as well as adequate funding and resources. If there is not a clear objective in place in the in the intervention or the uh, peacekeeping mission, then or broad support more generally and realistic goals, then there is the problem that it is less likely to be effective in its achievable mandate. And so when these criteria are actually met, when we actually see that there is a generally broad support for a particular implementation and when it is clearly well funded and resourced and when there are clear objectives and realistic goals in place, we find that there are successful missions that are performed by the UN Security Council. So, for example, in 1990, we've already mentioned UN Security Council Resolution 678, uh, which mandated military action against Iraqi forces upon their invasion of Kuwait. Now, it should be very easy for you to remember this resolution because it is 678. So you should be able to um, have that one as an easy to remember Security Council resolution for when you go into an exam. And subsequently, safe havens were established by the UN Security Council in Resolution 688 in 1991 again, providing more support for those who were under attack by Saddam Hussein, namely Iraqi Kurds. In 2011, we see Resolution 1973, which mandated the establishment of no-fly zones in Libya to prevent, um, in order to prevent suffering of the civilian population at the hands of Gaddafi. Now, on its face, this is a controversial uh, uh, resolution because, uh, at least prima facie, it was seen as a success because it was um, mandating, it was a clear objective, and it clearly established no-fly zones in Libya. However, this resolution utilized uh, was utilized, should I say, by NATO as military justification for intervention in Libya. And the NATO intervention in Libya was something that is arguably controversial and arguably something that we need to would we would need to debate in the future and i'm sure we probably will when we get on to looking at um, security issues relating to nato in a few lessons time but we also see when we look at the 
economic sanctions that were placed on Iran, for example, when it came to the production of their nuclear programs from 2006 to 2015, that this was also successful and effective in the particular mandate of those particular sanctions, which was to try and prevent Iran from creating nuclear weapons or getting hold of a nuclear weapon. And it would culminate in Iran abandoning its nuclear programs, as well as the Iran nuclear deal, which was established under the Obama administration. Um, subsequently, it was dropped by the Trump administration. But nevertheless, we have uh, the fact that Iran at the time did not have and did not have the pursuance to nuclear programs uh, in their particular um, state. Now, the extent to which they are pursuing nuclear weapons at the moment is something that is uh, another matter for debate. And the extent to which the Iran nuclear deal was a success, again, is another matter of debate and is beyond the scope of uh, this particular lesson. So those are instances and examples of case studies that you can actually utilize to come to the conclusion that the U.S. Security Council was successful in its operations. What about the counter argument? Because there are, of course, many are there are many counter arguments to this particular debate as well. Many scholars come to the conclusion that one of the main issues with the U.N. Security Council is, of course, the political position of the five permanent members of the council itself. We mentioned this briefly at the end of the last lesson, but essentially it, it creates firstly an imbalance. It creates a conflict of interest in terms of certain situations where permanent members have a vested interest in uh, in attaining certain goals that are not aligned with the goals of the Security Council more generally. And essentially action by the Security Council can be halted if it is not in the best interest of the five permanent members due to their veto power. And so there are multiple examples of this being the case. So, for example, during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, there was a distinct unwillingness on the part of the United States to commit humanitarian intervention. And this is due to the fact that there was political backlash following humanitarian intervention that took place in Somalia in 1993, something that resulted in the deaths of, uh, I believe, around 13 servicemen. Now, the reason why we see a lack of intervention on the part specifically of the USA in that in Rwanda um, is not because they didn't know about what was happening in Rwanda. In fact, during the Rwandan genocide, the United Nations uh, did not leave. Um, neither did the International Committee for the Red Cross and Red Crescent. And so there was ample evidence coming out of Rwanda that there was um, this genocide taking place. But the US... Uh, for multiple um, complicated reasons, probably geopolitical reasons, one of them being this lack of intervention or lack of motivation for intervention due to Somalia in 1993, um, essentially was showing a distinct unwillingness for humanitarian intervention. And it was only until um, very, very late on during the conflict that intervention would actually take place within uh, on the part of the United States. Now, this is not to suggest that the rest of the United Nations um, sat by. I believe Uganda um, committed a number of different troops to Rwanda um, during this particular genocide. Uh, Belgium did at the time, uh, at the beginning, and then withdrew their troops after a number of them were murdered. And so we have this complicated situation here where we have the rest of the international community um, uh, being stuck in a position where they really don't want to commit to humanitarian intervention, but in reality really should have done. Equally, again, we can talk about the fact that it was not in the Russian Federation's interests to act against President Assad during the, uh, during the Syrian, Syrian Civil War in 2011, since Assad is a ally of the Russian Federation and aligned themselves with the Russian Federation. So it was not in the Russian Federation's interest to utilize the Security Council to act against President Assad, even if he was committing atrocities in the Syrian Civil War. Moreover, complexities begin to um, increase even more when it is actually the permanent members themselves that are actively engaged in controversial actions that the Security Council exists to prevent. So we know already about the uh, March 2022 invasion of Ukraine. I'm not going to dwell on that in any great detail. We've, I, I'm pretty sure we've talked about the Russian invasion of Ukraine in every single geopolitical lesson that we have done on this channel. Um, so we're, I'm going to brush over uh, the Russian invasion. But one suggestion that um, has been levied at trying to uh, resolve this deadlock in relation to Russia is to suggest that actually the Russian Federation shouldn't be a permanent member because 
the original permanent member wasn't the Russian Federation, it was the Soviet Union. And so arguably, because the Soviet Union no longer exists, there should be one less permanent member because it is a country that no longer exists. It, is, it was almost just assumed that the Russian Federation would take up the mantle of being a new permanent member when the Soviet Union collapsed. And maybe some people have questioned this in a little bit more detail, especially since um, at least 2014 and now as well in 2022. But equally, we could talk about the little action that has been done on the part of uh, China in terms of the potential genocide, where there is in fact real evidence of, that exists of a potential genocide of Uyghur Muslims in regions within China. Again, China being a permanent member of the Security Council means that it is difficult for the Security Council to act in an effective manner in that regard. And again, I don't want to be trying to uh, levy these criticisms entirely at the non-Western, in quotation marks, non-Western um, states within the permanent membership, because you can just as easily levy those criticisms against the United States and the United Kingdom on the part of their various military interventions and military actions across the world in all of their conflicts that they have been involved in. U.S. in uh, Vietnam, you could talk about U.S. intervention when it comes to uh, their meddling in um, processes, in military processes in terms of in Latin America. You can obviously talk about the fact that the United States and the United Kingdom were engaged in an illegal conflict in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. So the only reason why I'm bringing up these particular points here on against Russia and China is is because of the fact that these are the most modern and the most up-to-date pieces of evidence. The Russian invasion is still continuing to take place. It took place and it began this year. And the uh, Uyghur Muslims in China have been um, in a position of discrimination for, for many years and continuing to be in this position as well. So... Generally speaking, you can um, really attack the UN Security Council from a number of different angles. On the one hand, you can um, attack the fact that the permanent membership aligns themselves with certain, uh, let's say, unsavory characters or unsavory political positions, if we want to talk about specifically the United States in 1994 and Rwanda, or specific individuals, if you want to talk about the Russian Federation's alignment with Assad in 2011. And you can also talk about the fact that the permanent members themselves can actively get involved in controversial issues that can block the Security Council uh, directly.